join them, you never know what you get from these programs. People say, oh, I want to I get in the REO market. Well, these are the very first beginnings. If you're not in these systems, the banks can't see you. The asset managers can't see you. Um, there's a very slight chance you're just going to get a listing. But I have gotten listings from banks just because I'm part of these programs. They go searching. Nobody else is around. Um, especially now, most of the people I talk to, how many people in here have an Equator account? <laughs> There's a very good chance that S4 will get a listing of foreclosure when they start coming. There's a very good chance that S4 will start getting a lot of foreclosures and blow everybody out of the water. So who in here has a ResNet account? Same people. All right, so you guys got to start paying attention to these things because they're coming fast. Um, so just start playing around with them. Uh, default websites, there's a lot of them out there. Um, the Five Star has one, uh, DS News. Uh, there's there's so many of these but just start looking around and save them in your bookmarks because you want to read they have really amazing articles about what bank just bought that bank out what outsourcer just closed and who just got promoted to president of this bank and and pretty soon you start getting this picture of what's going on and you start learning um, industry conventions so in September I'll be in Dallas I'll be at five star if you guys want to go with me let me know uh, five star is where a lot of these uh, industry things happen there's, if you Google Five Star on your phone, uh, 2016 convention, you'll see they'll have BPO classes, these certifications, they'll have workshops, uh, and then at night there's parties with all the players in the industry, that kind of thing. Um, so you might want to start looking into those. Um, look for training and prospecting. So we all know Mike Ferry, Tom Ferry, Craig Proctor, all these people that are really big right now. But as the market changes, all these new names emerge and these people are professionally, um, their, prof their profession is to teach you how to professionally go after um, default and things of that nation, uh, nature. Uh, so like Lee Hanish, you might have heard of. He's got, he's got a really amazing program coming out pretty soon if you're watching Lehigh. Um, there's a bunch of stuff. And subscribe to data sites like RealtyTrack. Uh, that's the one I use. CoreLogic has some stuff. Uh, there's a million of those too. But for 20 bucks a month, they will send you the foreclosures daily, and you could sort them by price range, city, all that stuff. And that's another really good way to watch NODs and NO, uh, NOSs, notice of sales. And you could start seeing things happen. Um, also, uh, I forgot to put it on the slide, but the hedge fund companies are going to be starting to play in these realms a lot right now. They are very smart. They pay people millions of dollars a year to know when the market's crashing. They promise their investor three to five year holds. So five years ago, there's probably about 4,500 to 5,000 homes owned by hedge funds in Santa Clarita alone. If you split that up between this room, there's a lot of people. So you want to be on these as well. Uh, they're going to they're going to be pulling from all these uh, programs, too. So Scott Taylor, my brother-in-law, is in the back. This is our podcast that we started, the Real Estate Marketing Show.com. I know I've been working on the Clubwell TV a lot lately, and that's that's been a priority. But it's still up. There's episode seven that you can see right here. There's an hour and a half of something about Scott and I talking about REO. Why are you looking at me like? Oh. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of weird. And it seems to me like it was eight months ago. So if, if you're watching, Scott in the back said it's, it's weird that things that we were doing eight years ago are coming back. The same lingo, the same people, the same programs. And uh, I would highly recommend you guys start with this because all of you guys come up to me individually and say, I want to get an REO, teach me. Well, here's, here's really raw how, to, how we really we start getting into it. Um, so let's see where we at on that. So that's kind of it for that. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about Scott since he's in the back over there. Um, Scott Taylor is my brother-in-law. He owned SCV Leasing with me since 2007. And I want to talk to you a little bit about how we diversified before I bring him up. Uh, we did some really amazing things together. Uh, we started a company called Agent Mechanics. Um, since we had SCV leasing, we found out that that was also very good for real estate. and It was helping us diversify in a down market. So I was doing REO, I was doing short sales, I was doing BPOs, and then property management came along, and we started that company, Agent Mechanics. What we would do, and this is just to get your minds moving and thinking, uh, we would fly people, and first of all, I would go to all these conventions that I'm talking about, right? And I used the same philosophy I'm teaching you guys right now about your sphere needs to hear, everybody needs to know and trust you and, and look at you as an expert in the industry. Well, within minutes, and I mean minutes because you know me, I'm a little, uh, people started to trust me. And I was invited 
to speak for Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae. I was on the stage at Five Star. I was on the stage all over the country and talking about property management and teaching the banks and consulting with the banks on what to do with all their inventory. So that led to an idea that Scott and I had. We said, well, let's train agents how to do what we do. So we started this company. We'd fly people in from all over the country into our office in Valencia, and then eventually it got so big at the Hilton. And we'd put 20, 30 to 40 people in a room at $5,000 a piece per day to teach them this. And we'd teach them how to do uh, the things that the banks wanted them to do with property management. And that worked out great for a while. A couple of years until the market started picking back up. People got busy again, and we, we phased that out. Uh, but interesting enough, um, Scott and I went through a lot of different things together. We spoke on stages all over, and we did Disney management training together. And you know, we got pretty close over the years. And at, towards the end of this, um, well, I'll, I'll, I hope you don't get mad. Um, but one of the things that happened is we were speaking on stages, and that was, remember those videos of me all in shape, all buff, and all that? That was when I was really into health because I was standing up in front of 400, 500 people at a time and selling a product. And back in that time, Scott was very unhealthy. Scott was, what was your max weight? 270 pounds for a small frame guy, and he was big, and I, and I basically begged him, I said, dude, you got to get into shape. If you're going to be on stages with me and we're going to sell $5,000 a piece products, you know, people are going to not trust us if we're super out of shape. And then all of a sudden, he's analytical. He took it totally to a next level, and over the next few years, lost uh, how many pounds? 80, 85 pounds. To me, that's a lot of weight. I'm struggling to lose 20, right? <laughs> this is really hard. So what, what happened towards the end of all uh, our partnership with SCV Leasing is everything. He found his passion, and that's what he's really trying to do in life, and that's what we're all trying to do. And we've had speakers come in to talk to about us. So Scott got into health. And not only did he get into health, but he got so deep, it's scary. So I think, I don't know if I should call him a health coach, but I do because he knows more than anybody I've ever met on this planet about nutrition and staying alive and avoiding disease and stuff like that. So that's why I asked him to come on here. So since we've uh, dissolved our partnership with SCV Leasing, he's done even more of this. And that's basically his life, is helping people understand how to survive and eat healthy and uh, manage it. And, he's, and he comes from a different perspective as some of our other speakers because he's that analytical. And everything he says, he's studied beyond belief to where I'll get text messages at 10 o'clock at night saying, you know what, my hemoglobin is down 0.1230%. And that's a, you know, it's like, whoa. And he's got apps and all these crazy things. So welcome, Scott Taylor. Thank you for being here, Scott. <laughs> I'm going to do a little computer switcheroo. So if you could briefly, while I switch computers, tell them uh, where you're at, what you're doing. That'd be rad. Sounds good. Let you do that. All right, so here's the good news. I got nothing to sell you, right? This is just a conversation. I'm not coaching nothing. I'm, there's no product in the back. There's nothing. This is me helping you. You have a question? Ask. If I don't have the answer, I'll tell you. Let's see if we can work it out, right? So now we can all go, man, they're going to try and hit me up for money. <laughs> if I wanted to, I could. I got nothing to sell you. Thanks, brother. OK, man. You're all good. All right. That fat to fitish, right? Because, I mean, you know, that's not fit. That's just fit-ish. Be loud for our streamers. Be loud for our streamers. You got it. Oh, I see. That has to be there. All right. I understand now. All right, so Michael said, uh, I was pretty big. We can see on the right, I was pretty big. <laughs> Bigger than anybody in this room, I think. That's for sure. All right. So all oh, that came off. Uh, on the left there, just for fun, uh, was last... Well, it'd be a year ago, January. That was the Dopey Challenge. You ever know the Dopey Challenge? Every year for, so I'll go back to it. Every year for uh, Walt Disney World Marathon Weekend. They, wow. Anybody? Bueller? I think it's just that thing. All right, so uh, they have their Disney Marathon Weekend. So the year before, so 14, we, the wife and I went and we ran the Disney Marathon. All very much fun. You would think Florida's flat. Apparently, it's not. In Disneyland, it's very hilly. They have like a nine-mile stretch. It's just straight hill. Uh, so then the Dopey Challenge was sort of the culmination of all this, which was uh, on consecutive days, so Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, a 5K, a 10K, a half marathon, and a marathon. That's a brutal challenge, unless they call it Dopey, all the way through it. And, and you have to train in the summer. So I'm in Tehachapi, 
uh, but to get like 26 miles of straight, that means I'm going to Bakersfield, which is something like the surface of the sun, right? And we're running like 26 miles on the surface of the sun and just to try and get the training in. Uh, so then after it's like, like the whole way, I'm, I'm, I'm never doing this again. I'm never doing this again. This sucks. I hate this. I don't even know why I did this. I came across that finish line. I'm crying. Like, it's like two steps. I'm like, I need ice for my knees. I'm like, I bet I could do it faster next year. It was just, it's insane. All right, so that's, just so you know, like that's like 265, probably 270 me. Now beautiful, like 185-ish. Yeah, looking good. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about how that train wreck happened, right? Uh, here's what we think doctors know. We think doctors know about nutrition. Right? Here's the facts. Uh, only 25% of medical schools teach nutrition at all to their doctors. That's a shockingly low number. Like the high was 37% in the mid 80s. And since then, 25% teach any nutrition to your doctor. And of those, the maximum amount of nutrition that those 25% get is 25 hours. So imagine over a long weekend, you could get as much nutritional training as your doctor. And yet that's where we go, right? Hey, doc, why aren't you telling me this? And so I'm going to throw some sort of doctors under the bus and some philosophy under the bus here. But that's, like, they just don't know. That's why your doctor's not telling you. They don't know. Right? They're busy doing what they're doing. That's what they don't know. All right. So when I was a kid, uh, my dad was diabetic. So he got, when he went into the Air Force, they diagnosed him as diabetic. So he was an insulin diabetic uh, all the way up. Uh, his doctor, not knowing, said, Drink diet soda, it's better than regular soda. This is nutritional advice my father receives. Right? Uh, fast forward that sort of unhealthy lifestyle, right? uh, somewhere around his late 50s, uh, loses one of his legs below the knees. Uh, so, um, uh, the, the, what's the word? Someone help me with the word. Uh, circulation. Yeah. Circulation, really poor in diabetics. Right? So, so he loses one of the legs below his knees. Uh, a couple years later, the other one. So he spends like the last four years of his life as essentially a double amputee in a nursing home. Like my mother tried to bring him home, but she couldn't. Like he fell down one time. Like she had to call the paramedics to like lift him up because she couldn't get him up. He was a big man. Avoidable. Avoidable. Like it didn't ever have to happen. You can be diabetic. You can be normal weight. There's some Olympic athletes you'll see in the next three weeks. Diabetics. But Olympic athletes, that's fantastic, right? So it didn't have to happen. But he never got the message. Like the message never reached him. So that gets on to me then, right? I mean, so I'm not getting that message. I'm just eating whatever I'm eating. Uh, as it turns out, my mother's also a lifetime smoker. Uh, back in the days uh, when you, you smoked in your car and you did everything else. So as a result, I smoked at least a pack of cigarettes every day up to about 17 and a half when I left for university and I never went back. Every year I had horrible bronchitis. Terrible for like two weeks a year. Just terrible bronchitis. I haven't had bronchitis since the day I walked out of that house. You don't think those two things are related? Right? Think that doctor said anything to her? Like, uh, hey, by the way, you might want to not smoke in the car. No. This is the nutritional advice that I received when I was a child for breakfast. Ho ho's. Do you remember ho ho's? Yeah. Ho ho's and Pepsi. <laughs> because to quote my mother, at least you had something in your stomach when you went to school. Shockingly good advice. So, uh, hard reason to think that I couldn't have ended up 270 pounds. All right, does that make sense? All right. So, how do we sort of get away from that? I got away from it just in diet, right? So I just sort of just smarted myself out of it. I'm like, I can't live like that. When you see your dad die, right? So my dad dies of ostensibly result. I mean, he died from a staph infection in the hospital, but. He's in the hospital because of diabetes. Uh, when you see that, and you see them lose their house. So back, you know, you talk about short sales. Lost the house, right? So he had, he had his business. He was that breadwinner. Got sick. Eventually died. They lost everything. Everything they built all their lives. Gone. Why? Diet. Diet. He had a bad diet. Holy crap. You don't think it would have been nice if someone would have just stood in front of him once and said, 
uh, put down the chicken leg, Jim. Like, nobody. All right, it's incredible. All right, so these are the leading killers for the U.S., right? So you got heart disease, cancer, diabetes, chronic respiratory disease, stroke, chronic liver disease, and hypertension. Top killers of anybody. Uh, every single one of those, fixable diet. Like every single one. You don't want heart disease? You don't want to ever cut your heart open, tear it open, go in, grab your heart, change the valves around, take a vein from your leg, right? That's what they do, take a vein from your leg, they put it in, they rewire the whole plumbing together. You never have to have it. It's a completely elective. The number one killer in the United States is elective. You will eat yourself there. It's not genetic. It's not by luck. Diet. It's the only thing you're going to get there. So let's talk maybe a little about heart disease. We said no one ever has to die of heart disease, right? Makes sense? Does anybody, anybody want to argue with that? Or fair enough. I just want to make sure. All right. So how do we get there, right? Cholesterol. Right? So let's see where we are with cholesterol. Right? In general, it's you know, good cholesterol, bad cholesterol. All right, here's what happens. That little cholesterol gets in there. It moves to the arteries. It hits the arteries. It makes a little pocket. All right? So it carves out a little pocket right in the edge of your artery. And that pocket gets filled with plaque. And plaque's really sticky stuff. So plaque goes into the pocket, and everything seems like it's going good. But it's sufficiently sticky that when other plaque comes down, kind of like a hook and loop, right? Like Velcro, it sticks to it. And then other plaque sticks to that, and other plaque sticks to that, and other plaque sticks to that. And it makes a little bridge. And eventually that bridge just cuts that artery off. And that's when most of us learn about heart disease. You have a heart attack. That's like the first time you almost always know that you have heart disease is the heart attack. All right, so here's what the latest science tells us now. We thought that's all cholesterol did was make the hole. Cholesterol is even worse. Cholesterol goes in, it makes the hole, the plaque goes in, builds the bridge, cholesterol goes back in, invades the plaque and lives there, and grows little crystals. And the cholesterol crystallizes and crystallizes and crystallizes, and it keeps building up, and then boop, pops the plaque. Heart attack. So cholesterol, like, Really bad. Like, we thought it was kind of bad. Really bad. Right? Amazing. So where are we going to get our cholesterol from? Anybody? Eggs? Eggs, right? So eggs, perfect answer. The number one, an egg is so unhealthy that they can't call it healthy. Like, there, there's so much correspondence between the egg board and advertising. They have to sort of send to the FDA, and they say, we want to say this about our product. An egg is so unhealthy that the correspondence between them is hilarious to listen to. So they say, we're healthy. And then the FDI write them and say, you can't call your product healthy. It's too high in cholesterol. It's not healthy. And then they'll try and figure out another word for healthy. And then the FDA will write them back. You can, the letters are published. I mean, you can read them. And they just say, nice try, but that's a word like healthy. And you can't use that word. Right? So what, I, I don't, like in my head, the incredible edible egg. That's the best thing you can say about your product, is it's edible? <laughs> that's like my mom's cooking. It's edible. It wasn't amazing, but it's edible. Like, that's how bad egg is for you. Not even the government, who will allow anything, won't allow you to call it healthy. All right? So egg, anybody else? Meat, red meat, red meat dairy, right? So anything, essentially anything animal-based. I can't think of anything. Can't think of anything cholesterol related that's that's not animal based. I mean, there's some. Yeah, I just don't think it exists, right? Because that's just the way it is. It's just how it gets synthesized, right? All right. So that's a little bit about heart disease. Right? And I'm not going to go through all those. I'm just going to give you a few sort of random examples. So how do we avoid it? We're going to lower that cholesterol. So the general consensus, a total cholesterol of 200. That's the general published consensus. Um, there's something called the Farmingham Heart Study. They, did, they, they tested all different diets. And they said, if you can get your cholesterol to 150 or below, right, only a handful out of all the people ever studied in Farmingham developed heart disease at 150 or below, and no one died from it. So no one died. So 200 is what sort of the medical literature says. 150 is almost your heart attack proof target. How about blood pressure? We'll lower our blood pressure a little bit. So we could do, we could maybe not eat so much salt. 
right? We could maybe be a little easier on ourselves, meditate. We could do something, right? We could certainly work on blood pressure with diet. So Harvard researcher Frank Sachs finds that with, in the medical literature, you'll see the word strict vegetarian. So I think we could, that vegan or plant-based or whole food plant-based or however you want to say that, but they'll use the word strict vegetarian. So in strict vegetarian, they had the lowest blood pressures out of anybody. So you would think like, okay, so we know if blood pressure is one of the factors of heart disease, we lower the blood pressure, we limit the heart disease. Fair enough. Uh, the American Heart Association comes in and says, we're going to do the DASH diet. So that's, dry, that, that's fruit, vegetables, low-fat dairy, and reduced amounts of meat. Right? That's the DASH diet. And that's what American Heart Association recommends. So now maybe the disconnect in your head is, Harvard, researcher Frank Sachs says, plant-based, lowers it the best, like out of anybody. American Heart Association, who you think is going to help us out, says, nope, we're going we're to allow meat. And, the, and you think, maybe, maybe the Heart Association doesn't know about Mr. Sachs. Well, as it turns out, Sachs is the lead for the diet committee of the American Heart Association. He's on that thing. So he already knows this is the way to actually do it. So why does he do DASH? Because in his sort of synopsis to it, he says, somebody asked that. He says, because I don't think people will comply. I know how to eliminate it, but I don't think you're willing to give up an egg. So I'm not going to tell you to give up an egg. I don't think you'll comply. So instead of eating full-fat yogurt, I'll say eat low-fat yogurt, a little better for you. Your entire health and all the nutrition advice you get is based on they don't think you'll do the things you need to do to be healthy. That's incredibly sad when that's the standard. I don't tell you what to do, but you're not going to do it anyway. So why try? That's, that's the state of modern medicine. We don't think you're going to do it. So we invest in pharmaceuticals. Because when you don't do it, we know how to fix it at least a little bit. And so the drugs, the pharmaceutical drugs, so ineffective. They know, and we know, that in a heart disease situation, 80% will fail. It's got, drugs have an 80% failure rate. 80% of people will have a heart attack again on drugs, so statins and those kinds of things. Get your cholesterol below 150 and never have it again. And what's the downside? I mean, that, that's what I sort of say. I mean, I, the downside of statins are death. I mean, like, just read the possible downsides to, to, to the drugs. Right? We hear them just on the TV. It'll cause blindness, it'll cause this, it'll cause death, it'll cause it. And that's just what happens. And it's not always their fault. I mean, we make fun of that list of things it could possibly do. And all that means is that somebody during the trial died, and that was the cause. They don't know whether it was because of the drug or not. So that's why they have to list that long list. So some of the absurd things they list aren't probably related to the drug at all. It just happened to be. But there it is. That's why they do it. But it's just mind boggling. Like what's the downside to getting your cholesterol below 150? It's just like, you know, if I told you, if I told you, uh, eat more cabbage and have some beans and, and, and a piece of broccoli. Like, what would the possible downside to that be? Like, none. Like, there's just no adverse side effect to it. You're like, ah, I didn't like it. I went back to something else. Fine, go. But start maybe in your head weighing. Like, if someone comes to you and says, I want you to take this pill, you say, well, is there an alternative to that pill? Is there possibly something I can do? I know you guys, they, they talked about uh, supplements last week, right? Cool. I don't, I don't know what he talked about. I don't want stuff on his feet. But if you're saying, you know, take this pill, is there something out there that I can do that's maybe not pill related? Just can I eat broccoli instead of a vitamin C pill or an iron pill or spinach? Sure. So think about that a little bit, right? Zero, when, when the side effect is death on the pill, when the side effect is nothing, like the adverse side effect, right? Just think, I think you can get better. But let's just say I'm wrong. The adverse side effect is nothing. I'll go with nothing. Like, that's the least expensive, easiest way to go. And then maybe last on those is lifestyle change. 
Uh, so diet, exercise, stop smoking, right, those kinds of things. Um, can decrease your risk of heart attack. So just lifestyle changes by 90% for men, 92% for women. So come in line with this, 92%. Just a little bit. That's not bad. Those are like really good odds. Watch what goes in your mouth. Sharpen it up a little bit. Don't have a problem with heart disease. I just, I can't even, uh, I can't even, uh, I can't even, uh, what, why? And again, when you, when, and you stand there, you think, why? Why did they tell me this? Oh, yeah, I forgot, because they never got it either. Like, the expert never got it. The guy I was going to all these years never got that message. So sad. All right, cancer. So maybe that second leading killer, cancer, right? We probably all know somebody has cancer, had cancer in the family. Uh, a very shockingly low percentage of cancer, like somewhere in that 3 to 5% range, is genetic, which I found amazing like, to, to find stats like that. It's shockingly low that cancer is genetic. It's not. It's, spoiler alert, it's lifestyle-based. It just, it just is. And we'll talk about this a little bit. I'll sort of talk to you about what that means and what it looks like. Uh, so 90% of lung cancer, smoking. Right, so if I would have sort of, if I was still 17 and <laughs> secondhand smoking those two packs a day, you know, I'd probably have it, right? Uh, but 90%. So don't smoke, 90% chance you're not getting lung cancer. Right? Uh, 5% uh, and sort of on these, on these numbers, like 5% uh, of breast cancer is genetic. So only 5%. I thought it was a lot bigger number in my head until you start looking at the studies that, that it's shockingly low percentage is. Um, colorectal cancer is like the number one cancer out there that really kills people. Uh, one hot dog a day, and we'll talk about this more later on too, that's 50 grams, so it's just one hot dog. So 50, a quarter of a chicken breast, one hot dog, one hot dog a day, an increase of 18% in colorectal cancer. One. Again, he's like, I don't eat hot dogs. Great. They don't eat. So eat a piece, of, two pieces of bologna. Eat a quarter of a chicken. Like, it's a shockingly low. Eat. You know, go to Subway. Like all the meat they load up on Subway. Like I mean, that's a huge increase. It's way more than 50 grams. So shocking. All right. So here's. What you probably don't know about cancer. We all are carrying around either cancerous cells or precancerous cells in us. We all have them sitting right here with us right now, each one of us. Do they get turned on or not is the question. So what is keeping us from that? Every cell has, we talked in biology, we talked about cells. What they didn't talk about is telomeres, sort of newest, latest research, telomeres, yeah? There you go. So we've got somebody aware of it, about, probably about 1 in 30, though. Uh, so imagine in a telomere, so I'm just going to call my fistus, that's the cell. And this telomere is just a little piece of this little cell that kind of hangs on. And here comes our little cancerous cell, and this healthy cell goes and kills this cell. All right? So that's what the telomere does. And the problem is, it gets a little shorter each time it does that. So another cancer cell comes along, and now it's a little shorter yet. And so eventually these things could potentially have no more telomeres, so they can't have any more fighting. And when that balance gets out of hand, we get cancer. Right? So researchers are thinking now it's this telomeric length, and can we lengthen telomeres? And can we make it can we make an environment that cancer doesn't like? Right? So can we go more alkaline, less acid? Can we do things that don't stimulate cancers in our body? So that's the kind of idea. So the telomere length, biological aging, you'll kind of hear those together, those are all those are all super popular. That's exactly how cancer works in a very sort of rudimentary, Sesame Streety kind of way. All right, so how are we going to avoid that? Spoiler alert again: plants, right? Plants, seeds, nuts, grains, legumes, as much of that as you can put in you. I'm not going to. I'm not going to slap the turkey leg out of your hand. I, I want to, but I won't. I get it. But as much of as many plants as you can put in you: nuts, seeds, grains. Beans, right, we'll talk about beans in a little while. But by, by, if anything is allowed to be called a superfood, it's beans. Beans solve so many amazing things. It's just in the research now. If, if, if there were a big bean, like there's big egg or big pharma, like you would see it everywhere. Uh, the processed meats. So the processed meats, uh, toxic to the cells, diminish the telomere length. Right? So toxic. Um, I said hot dogs are you, right? 
bacon, ham, hot dog, sausage, all processed meats, chicken nuggets, right? Any of those? We dig any of those? I haven't had one in my life, but like you feed them to your kids, maybe, perhaps. The World Health Organization recently labeled them a group one carcinogen. Name another group one carcinogen, Holder. Uh, cigarettes. Cigarettes. Do cigarettes cause cancer? Yes. <laughs> Bacon, ham, hot dogs, sausage, processed meats. Class one carcinogen known to cause cancer. No sign on the side of the avoid this may cause cancer, like we don't have the warning label. I don't know why this gets missed. I just named group one carcinogen. Like if you're feeding kid hot dogs, fire up a lucky strike and just set it right next to them. Because they're, yeah, I get it. They're, they're, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to admit they're not a one-to-one -one and, I, and I'm using a little fun with it. But they're in that same category. That's shocking to me that it's that bad, that, 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 it, that processed meat is that unhealthful that they now, it, it's so unhealthful that the meat industry is trying to come out now, you, and you see a bunch of papers they published uh, that, that come out and say, how do we get around? We get it. We get, finally everybody's caught up and we, they know it's bad too. How do we get around it? Right? And so now they're talking about the different things they want to add. You know, we should do this, we should do that. We can take out the nitrites. We don't have to. We can substitute this. We can put in more of this. And, but they say, even in their own papers, well, yes, but then when you slice that fake meat, then it doesn't leave, it doesn't come off the knife clean, so there's this textural issue and people won't buy it. So they're okay with giving you cancer because they know you want meat to be a certain way. Or you want that bologna to look a certain way. You want the hot dog to taste a certain way. So they're fine giving you cancer and letting you sort of go. That's what they're selling, according to the World Health Organization. Not me, the World Health Organization. It's just shocking to me. All right, so let's promote telomere lengthening. All right, so plant-based diets showed that they will lengthen telomeres. All right, so plant-based diet, reverse aging, just in a very simple cellular level. Right, we're all getting older. Yes, our telomeres are all getting, as you know, 40, 50, 60, it all starts to shorten. Change your diet, change that aging process. Right, add on to it. Um, modest exercise. So we talk about exercise. I hit the gym, maybe most of you hit the gym. We see people doing CrossFit. We see people doing crazy stuff. I'm going to work out till I hurl. Yeah, that's cool. That's it. Perfect. It's for functional fitness in principle, right? So diet, if you want to lose some weight, right, watch that. If you want to be more functionally fit, you want to go upstairs easier, you want a better heart rate, you want to be able to do some things, lift the grandkids, kick a ball, you know, throw baseballs with little Johnny, that's what exercise is for. So do it, but you don't have to do a crazy amount of it. Most research has shown that 30 minutes of walking a day, clean diet, that's all you need. Right? If you want, sort of from a health standpoint. Beyond that, go crazy. Do what you want. If it, if it makes you feel good, kicks in the endorphins, and you're liking it, fantastic. Good for you. But that's all you really need to do from a research standpoint, but there's no extra added benefit after that. So, I don't know if that takes you to the gym or away from the gym. I don't know. But I know that you can't out-exercise poor eating. That's for sure. Like you. It's staggering, even like a, a small bag of french fries from McDonald's, it's, it's, it's like an hour on your bike or something. So, I mean, you just can't do it. So just know what you're getting into. All right, the last one I'll cover just real quickly, just because it's a family issue, is diabetes. And so like heart disease, cancer, everything else, right? spoiler alert again, diseases of affluence. Right? The more we eat, the worse we eat, the, the more diseases we get. Right, in principle. And we know this because now we're seeing kids that are four, five, six years old with type 2 diabetes. And about anybody else, sort of growing up, uh, we had like the one fat kid in class, and I wasn't it. Like I was rail thin. I wasn't that kid. We had like the one fat kid in class, and now there's like herds of them. Right? And, and people are like, oh, it's, it's Nintendo. It's, they're not going outside. Nope. It's the processed foods they're eating. It's just bad diet. They're just stuffing themselves with too many, too many calories. They're just in the wrong calories. So that's what's really getting them. All right, so 91% of diabetes can be attributed to bad habits, bad behaviors. 91%. That's pretty good. Change the bad habit, change the behavior. 91% diabetes free.
I'll take those odds. I will take those odds every single day. Uh, we talked a little bit about that animal protein consumption, so that quarter of a chicken breast, right, increases, sig significantly increases that risk of diabetes. Significantly right, in the literature. That's a strong word for them to use when they use the word significantly before a word like that. That's something. Um, so a plant-based diet beats out the American Diabetic Association diet, hands down. Just, and that's with no restricting calories, no carb counting. I don't, I, I eat till I'm full and that's it. Like I don't, I, I don't count calories, I don't count carbs, I don't worry about gluten. I, I did all that, I did it for fun, just like, oh, where's all my calories coming from? I, just, I totally did it, but I don't anymore, just because I, I just wanted to learn. I just wanted to learn where they're coming from, and it's amazing. And so, um, again, we can go right back to, why doesn't the American Diabetic Association recommend a sort of a whole food plant-based diet, right? Because they know you won't follow it. They know you won't do it. That's shocking to me. Like they won't at least recommend it. Instead of just saying, look, here's the best diet you could do. This is one we recommend. If you can't stick to that, here's the alternative. But they don't. They don't even, they don't even tell you that something else exists. They just say, here, take this, because they know they'll get the greatest amount of compliance with it. It's just it's shocking to me. Uh, and if you think this is new, uh, you're right. Uh, it is new data. Uh, we've only known that the plant-based diet will defeat diabetes only since the 1930s. So not that long. Like just so, like what is that, 80 years? Like so not very long. It is new data. Like the 1930s was just the other day. Okay. That you have to take this medicine in order to be not. But I didn't. I absolutely changed my diet. I exercised. I did everything you did. Yeah. And I'm no longer diabetic. There you go. So for those of us it's listening around, like, I think it's fantastic. It's exactly right. So just for those listening that didn't hear to our cameras, uh, the lady had, she had diabetes. The doctor said insulin and other drugs are your way out. She said, Thank you so much. Went home, changed the diet, started some exercise, diabetes free. Never hit the insulin, right? It's totally like, I mean, if, if you got there, if you got there from, I mean, you sort of type two doesn't just pop up. Like that's type one. You're sort of like, oof, you know, like so you're born. Like type two, you got there with habits. Makes sense that you can get away from there with habits. Those the exact same habits, right? So, all right. In the little blurb that I wrote up, uh, you might have seen the ice butter. Right, so I talked about butter's good, butter's bad. I just want to show you the, the sort of stretch that these guys will go to. So does anybody remember this cover from a few years ago? Butter's back. Okay, so this, is, this was butter's back. This was the cover of time. Uh, eventually they had to sort of do a mea copa retraction going, we screwed up. But here's the story, just to show you what happens. In 2008, the global dairy industry gets together at their annual convention, this one happened to be in Mexico City, and they say saturated fats and people's concept that saturated fats are bad for us is kicking our butt. We're not selling as much butter and cheese. We've got to do something. So they put a whole war chest together and a campaign that says we're going to find sympathetic scientists to go out and tell the public butter's good. Saturated fats are overrated and butter's good. So they find this guy named Ronald Krauss, Dr. Ronald Krauss, who has been with the National uh, Dairy Council as a scientist for them since 1989. Right, so I love, right? So we have the money. We have this sort of cabal interest of saying we're going to sort of get people to understand that saturated fat's okay, even though they believe it's not. And we have a sympathetic factor. Right, so there's two ways we can do this. We can, I can lock you in this room. I can measure your sort of cholesterol level. I can then adjust your diet up or down, and I can see what happens. And that's an experiment. So I can do it. I can just we can lock you in here and we'll do it. Uh, I can send you home and do the same thing. But let's just let's use that analysis. Uh, or I could simply just observe you. I can just stand here and say, hmm, I wonder. I wonder how that's working for everybody. Here's the problem. Genetically, everybody's cholesterol starting point is different. Right? So there's no way to draw any statistical correlation 
amongst any of us. Because your cholesterols are different. Mine's 150, yours is 175, yours is 200. It's just, they're all different, right? They're just different. There's no statistical correlation. We just are who we are. So imagine if you wanted to get a result. And this result is that saturated fat has no influence on cholesterol. What kind of study would you set up? An observational one. Why? Because there was no correlation between any of the data before. So no matter what you do, there'll be no correlation between any of the data after. You could eat more saturated fat or less saturated fat. The cholesterol is what it was. Because I, can't, because I can't align it, I don't know if it changed. And I don't know why it changed. That's exactly what Ronald Krauss did. You remember all the way back sort of into algebra when we were in high school, and you can't divide something by zero? That's what comes to my head, right? You just can't. You divide it by zero, your calculator goes E, gives you an error, right? The butter board and Dr. Ron Krauss set up an experiment to divide by zero. And they got exactly what they looked for. They didn't even run the, they didn't need to run the experiment because you could have known what would have happened. It wasn't even science. Like you knew the outcome ahead of time. They, they couldn't succeed. Thus, scientists were wrong about butter. According to the study. And, and, it got, and that's what got the news. It, it, it was shocking to me. The butter board only had to put doubt in your mind. That guy, that guy says butter's bad. This other doctor over here says butter's fine. I don't know who to believe. I'm just going to do what I want. That's all they want. That's the same thing that tobacco did in the 60s. All, right? all the way up until we, what, big tobacco was sitting in front of Congress, you know, admitting that they knew it was poison. That's the exact same technique they used all the way back in the 60s. Just raise doubt. It's all this in their, in their internal memos. Raise doubt. That's all you got to do. Just raise a little specter of doubt. People or sheep. They'll just, whatever, I'm giving up. Going back to my chicken leg. It's incredible. All right, so don't need to confuse, not convince. That's how they say it. We only need to confuse you, not convince you. Because you'll just give up. Mm. All right, so that's, I just want to sort of give you an idea of how, how it happens to you. Right, so we'll go just in a little quick bit. What are you going to do? So we're going to question the messenger, right? So we're going to question the messenger. Even if it's me, question them, right? I'm fine with that. But we'll see that a lot of these, you know, Americans for health is actually big dairy. You know, you know, people for better schools is you know, it's ConAgra. I mean, you, it's interesting who you, when you look behind them, you see uh, Mary Nestle. She's very good at this, where she'll go on. She's uh, from New York. Uh, food scientist from New York, and she'll go on and she'll do every study that comes out. And there's about 300 a week, I think, come out now. And she'll go on and she'll say, this is who it is, this is who's supporting them, this is why this conclusion came out, and this is, this is their, this is the problem with it. Like, this guy was being funded by, you know, so. And it happens within, um, it happens even within, with, within the plant-based. Uh, so, so you have big ag, right? I mean, big ag's job is to sell agriculture, so you'll see a lot of these fundings. A pear board did it a few years ago. They came out and they said, oh, pears are good for you. You know, and it was sponsored by, like, you know, the pear board of Washington. You know, they came to some conclusion. Sure, pears aren't probably going to hurt you, but there was nothing saying that pears were good for you versus, say, apples. Pear might have been better than a pat of butter. And pear wasn't bad for you, but there was nothing implicit that pear was going to reduce cancer in and of itself. So that's the kind of thinking you kind of have to do, right? Uh, and, and then the idea that there's no big broccoli. Why, why don't we hear broccoli is better for you? Because there's no big broccoli. There's, there's, there's no big bean. It just isn't. So those aren't, that's not going to move the needle. And maybe the last bit on this, and this is sort of another recent study that came in. They, they asked 300 uh, scientists, food scientists, um, uh, doctoral candidates, or grad students, doctoral candidates, said, what's the number one issue out there? And they sort of all generally came back. The consensus was this idea of publication. All science is funded by somebody. Uh, we don't really, in, in the US, it has to be funded by an organization. Uh, the government doesn't really just fund it, because that's where real science would happen, because then we can make mistakes. We can learn from those mistakes. That would be very useful. That's the way real experiments are run. 
Here what they have to do is they say they feel compelled to run an experiment that they think will be modestly successful and that will yield a headline worthy result. So that's the kinds of experiments that are being run now, which is a bit sad, but that's just the way we do them. So when someone says butter is back and butter is great, and the research says that wine and drink all the wine you want, just let, let, let that little spidey sense go up and say, maybe, maybe not. You know, if it was brought to you by E.N.J. Gallo or something. <laughs> all right. Uh, Harvard, did you see this one? Uh, Harvard this week, a Journal of American Metal Association. Uh, released a study uh, that said, uh, and they followed uh, 130,000 people, uh, some of them for up to 32 years. That's a long study, long cohort study. Uh, those people that ate high animal protein, uh, much higher risk than plant eaters for death, 10% uh, reduction in all cause mortality for the plant eaters. So you can just cut 10% off the top. If, if you don't, you know, ab above getting rid of hypertension, heart disease, diabetes, most cancers, all of that, right? So brand new, Harvard, this week. Um, now, here's, I think, the criticism. I think it's a super valid one. Uh, you'll hear people say, uh, OK, yes, but uh, a plant-based eater might be more likely to not smoke. They might be more likely to exercise. They might just, you know, people that do healthy things just generally do healthy things, right? And we see those people too. People at the gym, like I, you know, super, super paleo, you know, people out there with the CrossFit box, and they're just, and they, you know, they look, they're amazing. They're in amazingly good shape, right? So those other lifestyle factors. So I think people bring up that criticism. Super fair criticism. I really do. I think so. Uh, the problem, if it weren't that meat and the saturated fat. And when people get cut open, plaque and coronary artery disease, the only place you can get it in your body is from that. That's where I think it starts to fall down for me. But I appreciate the argument. Um, all right. Let's talk about uh, feeding, feeding your microbiome. Have you ever heard of microbiome? Yeah? So a couple people microbiome. It's a brand new sort of so telomeres. The genetic researchers are doing telomeres. Uh, gut, so you, like your gut is like the whole new bastion of science that people are looking at. Like they look at it completely different than they used to like two years ago even. So everything that comes into our body sort of hits that large intestine. And we used to think that it was all just for water. Oh, it just gets rid of water. Apparently not. Like do you remember the non-soluble fiber? There's soluble fiber and there's non-soluble fiber. I can remember that, right? And everybody goes, ah, oh, the non-soluble fiber passes right through you, and that's what it does. And so they found out that it doesn't. It gets into your gut, and the bacteria eat it. And that's what sort of makes a good sort of healthy body and a good healthy gut. So that, that's you know, like 75% it was, it was of your immune system is in your gut. That's where the food goes. It goes there. I think it's an incredible stat. So the more sort of robust you can make that microbiome, that gut, right, the healthier you're going to be. So I started concentrating on that like a year ago. I haven't been sick since. Like I just started like, I'm going to feed that thing. And that's all I have to worry about. I'm just feeding my gut. <laughs> it's incredible. So again, brand new sort of science. I think it's fascinating. So when someone comes up to me and they say, where do you get your protein? It's like, I don't know. Like, I honestly don't know. Like, I don't know how much protein I get. I get that plants have protein. I get that beans have some. I have no idea how much I intake, don't care, doesn't matter to me. Where do you get your fiber? That's a more interesting question. Like fiber, stop with the, stop with the protein, stop with the carbs, stop with the fiber. Start looking at fiber because that's what's feeding your body. And fiber, we're finding out, does a few interesting things. Uh, it feeds the gut, right? So you get in that microbiome. It releases hormones. So you can imagine a little circle. It releases hormones. Those hormones go out and say, you're full. Right? Turns off the full sensor. No fiber, no full. You eat something, no fiber, you'll just eat it all day long. It doesn't matter. Like you couldn't get, you couldn't get a full sensation. Like you get, oh, I feel sick. Like you know, like steak dinner, you go, oh, I feel terrible. Like really, because like you ate way, way, way too much. No fiber. 
So the hormones never got turned on and never told you you were full, so you never stopped eating. That's just super interesting. Uh, paleo, and I like, I like my paleo brethren. I'm good with them, uh, as long as they do this. Uh, Paleolithic man, in studies where they've found fossils, and then they sort of cut open the colon and take the poo from Paleolithic men, and they sort of measure that, and they can still do that. I'm shocked they can do it, and they can calculate about 104 grams of fiber, they figure, out of all the samples they've tested. So 104 grams of fiber in our Paleolithic ancestors. What that tells me, just based on a little bit that I know, they weren't eating plants. They were eating plants, not animals. Like you can't eat 104 grams of fiber. I, I can't. Uh, I measured mine one time. I think I might eat 50. I eat nothing but plants and beans all day. 50, 60 grams at the most. They were outstretching me by a factor of two. That's a staggering number to my head. I can't. I can't get my head around that. They're eating that much. Now it comes in part because the plants were different. And so every plant that you buy in the supermarket today isn't a plant that existed before, like ever. It didn't evolve. Like some guy made that. Like if you looked at a watermelon, like you wouldn't even recognize a watermelon to the watermelon you see today. Like completely just shockingly different. So everything that we've had have been hybridized. So every plant you buy is a hybridized thing. So they never had it. So it probably, it probably lacks some of that fiber that they had, shockingly. So if less than 3% of Americans get uh, the right amount of fiber, less than three, right? And that's like 30 grams, right? 30 grams. Like less than 3% get that. And if fiber is so important to gut health, immune health, everything about us health, do nothing else, keep an eye on your fiber. Like just try to see if you can get a little more fiber in your diet. Like it's nothing more complicated than that. You could uh, experiment. I'm just like a, like Mike said, I'm just like a crash test dummy. Like I will try anything. So for the last two weeks, I've been, I've been trying to what they call a time-restricted diet. So there's some research out of, um, out of the Salk Institute in San Diego that said, uh, you know like circadian rhythm, have you heard that? So you have a circadian rhythm. So we have, a, we, we have this sort of circadian rhythm. Uh, the gut microbiome also has a circadian rhythm. It's on the same sort of rhythm bit. Uh, some research says if you give that gut, those microbiomes, if you give that time to sort of digest and work and, and not just keep trying to feed it all the time, you'll be healthier. You'll be leaner. They find you'll, be, you'll, 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 just be, you'll have uh, less fat, more lean muscle. Right? So I've been trying it for the last two weeks. I actually like it. I don't think I've lost any weight on it, but I certainly feel like I'm getting a little more lean. I'll stay on it. And the idea there is, uh, so restricted feeding would just mean uh, 12 hours between the time that you first ingest any non-water drink. So 6 a.m., you pop up, you have a cup of coffee, and you start emailing clients. Uh, 6 p.m., you're done eating, 12 hours. 6 p.m., last bite of food, done, until 6 a.m. tomorrow. Like, that's just time-restricted feeding. And again, new science, is it going to hold up? Don't know. Uh, in the literature, women that do that for 13 hours, right? So women, uh, I'll back, women who had previously had breast cancer, right, had previously had breast cancer, did time-restricted feeding 13 hours between a 40% reduction in overall breast cancer reoccurrence from just that one act. It's massive. That's, that, no, that's a human trial. I mean, that's a real study. Not like mouse trial or nothing else. Like, that's a massive reduction for just not eating. They also find out that in, in sort of just released, uh, although I'm pretty like, I'm going to stay on that thing pretty hard. Uh, if you did it for the week and then took the weekend off, you would still get most of the benefit, as it turns out. So not bad. You can have your Saturdays off and get back on the horse, right? So maybe a trick experiment. That's what I did, you know, just sort of just experiment a little bit. Even when I went plant-based, oh, I'm going to try it for seven days, see if I feel better. I have 14 days, see if I feel better. 21 days, see if I feel better. If, if you feel better, do it. If you don't, don't do it. What do I care? You know, I mean, I can only bring you the facts. Uh, you might try removing just one thing. So I was vegetarian, and I was doing everything except, and I was still doing dairy. I thought, oh, I just need my protein. I just need that stuff, right? Um, so we're all adults here, right? I wasn't going, like, frequently at all. I just wasn't. And then I read some research out of England that said, oh, children, uh, 
that are constipated, uh, they take out the dairy, the kids go again. I'm like, oh, all right, I'll try that. Like, I stopped dairy like the next day and every day since. Like, one thing. That's so incredible. I can't even fathom how, how one little change like that like, makes all the difference in the world. That's fantastic. So think about it. Th Time-restricted feeding. Like, give it a try. Again, it's just an experiment. Like, what's the worst thing you're going to do? You wake up hungry? <laughs> you know? There's no reason to eat at 9 o'clock at night. You're going to bed. Like, I sleep better, too. But there's no reason to, 9 o'clock at night, you're going to bed. You don't need any energy to sleep. You're not going to die. Like, you're fine. So just give something like that a go. Like, don't eat after 7 or 8. Or just pick something like that works for you. See if you can just give your body a rest. All right, a couple more. Um, Supplements. I know uh, uh, Cash was that who was here. Right? I like that guy, and I like I like his store too. It's really good. But if you're going to do plant-based stuff at all, uh, the recommendation is B12. Everybody says supplement with B12, right? I do it every day, like B12. And but then in my head now I'm like walking around going, eh, maybe they're right. Maybe it's not a complete diet. Like it's B12. It's, you know, like like wouldn't the body like fix that? It would. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Here's the problem. Uh, we wash uh, our vegetables and we chlorinate our water. And that kills the B12. It's just a little microbe. So it kills it. So I'm like, oh, thank God. I thought it was just me. Like, we would produce it and we would get it out of the ground. We just, but we don't get cholera. That's good. We don't get B12. That's bad. So you can take that with a little pill. Uh, so people say, oh, people eat meat and they get B12. Technically true, uh, but they don't produce it either. They're mammals, so they don't. So, so cows don't produce B12. Cows just don't eat clean forage and clean water. The microbe gets in their body, then we eat the beef, which has the microbe, which means we get the B12. Hmm. So, I'm okay if that's the way you want to do it. But, or right, stick to B12 and move on with it. So, and then uh, uh, vitamin D is the only other one I take. I take uh, 2,000 uh, milligrams of vitamin D. And uh, recent studies of 56, uh, recent cohort study, 56. <clears throat> um, vitamin D uh, appears that people live 11% longer taking vitamin D. It's actually a super important one. You can get it from the sun, totally go crazy. I put on a lot of sunscreen so I don't get skin cancer and I try not to go out all the time. So I take a little bit, uh, so a couple thousand grams every day, milligrams that is, units I use, whatever I call them. Uh, that works for me. So somewhere between 2,000. Uh, if, if you're okay there, up to 4,000, maybe if you're obese, don't go on the sun, elderly, something else. So two to 4,000, you might want to think about that number just in your head. Seems to show pretty beneficial. Um, moderation. So look, I'm not, uh, as you can tell, uh, I'm not a moderation guy. Uh, but I don't think your broker is either. Uh, but we'll ask, Michael, uh, if I was going to go door knock, do I door knock moderately or do I door knock a lot? A lot. Moderation doesn't work. Why? Because our definition of moderation is different. Is one glass of wine moderate or is one bottle of wine moderate? One bottle is better than the two bottles I hit yesterday. I'm doing moderate. Like that idea of moderation. So if you're gonna if you're gonna do it, I'm just saying like think of it as an experiment. I don't I think of everything I do as an experiment. It's not me, it's not personal. There I try it and it either works or it doesn't work and we can move on from there. I didn't fail. The experiment failed. It's just an experiment. Like, do I feel better? Do I not feel better? Do I recover better from workouts? Do I not? When I go for a run, am I brisker in step or not? Like, super good. And Or I suppose you could go the other way. Uh, do you want moderate kidney failure, a moderate heart attack, moderate amputations? I mean, you could go moderate. So, All right. Uh, last thing I'm going to leave you with. Uh, is genetics. This is so cool. Uh, is everybody, 23andMe, does anybody know this one, 23andMe? So we can test our own genetics now. Uh, and we don't have to go to the doctor. For $199, uh, 23andMe, the number 23andMe. Uh, they'll send you a kit. They come out of San Francisco. Uh, you expectorate the kit, click it, send it back. They say, hey, we got your kit. They're super communicative. Like in six to eight weeks, they send you this report that's super cool. Uh, it tells you some genetic stuff, tells you some ancestry stuff. Uh, take that, and if you're going to write down 23andMe, also write down foundmyfitness.com slash genetics. 
so 23andme.com, foundmyfitness.com slash genetics. 23andme, 199 bucks, the most fun you'll ever have, finding out about things. Uh, then they'll send you, they, see they got busted. Uh, they're just back on now. They got busted a couple years ago because they were giving out what the government considered health advice and they weren't doctors. So they stopped. They raised their price. They stopped. Foundmyfitness.com, Dr. Rhonda Patrick, she'll give you advice for free. She has, you take your 23andMe data, you go to foundmyfitness.com slash genetics, press a button. She says, do you want me to import your genetics data from 23andMe? You're like, yeah. She imports it. In seconds, kicks out a report that tells you the most interesting stuff. So you'll find out the incidence of Parkinson's. Uh, I have a higher than likely risk of bladder cancer in my family. It turns out my grandfather had it, so I, who knew? Uh, uh, do you absorb vitamin D? Do you absorb vitamin A? Like these are all little adjustments you can make. Like my wife doesn't absorb vitamin A very well, so she takes extra A. Um, I have, it's sh shocking, uh, a higher propensity for obesity if I'm not careful. You think? Right, from our first picture, you think? <coughs> So the, it tells you all kinds of things. You're going to get Parkinson's, you're going to get Alzheimer's. Like it tells you all these things that you might have indicator factors for. It doesn't say you're going to get them, but it says these are some likelihoods genetically for you. These genetic markers come up in this way. So fascinating stuff. Like the most fun you can have for 199 bucks to do. It's so, so good. All right. Um, and certainly don't die, just eat healthy. Or sort of Michael... Pollen's version of that, eat food, mostly plants, not too much, would be good. Or my sort of version of that, and this is what I wish for all of you, whether you follow any of this advice, do anything else, just be happy, healthy, peaceful, and strong. That's it. Yeah. And then do you get another test? No, no. Foundmyfitness.com slash genetics. Right. Uh, that's the direct to Dr. Rhonda Patrick's site where she'll interpret them. Got it. There, there's a database. You can interpret them yourselves. It, it is a complicated database where for free, or, yeah, so you get back two bucks and someone will, you know, they, and you can look at the database. She'll actually just tell you issues, non issues. I'm like, perfect. All right, so the recipes, and it's a great question, and I brought some. They're back here. I brought a handful of them, uh, of some favorite, uh, of some that I like. Um, you know what? It just becomes over the years. Uh, we just, we've kind of developed some of them. Uh, for me, uh, do you have that Instant Pot? Has anybody bought that Instant Pot? No? Am I the only one with the Instant Pot? Oh, my God, the Instant Pot. Even, even if you're like a meat eater, go for it. Uh, like the Instant Pot, it's, like a, it's like, a, like a pressure cooker or a, or a slow, yeah, it steams, it pressure cooks, it slow cooks. Like I was cooking beans like in 45 minutes, done. It was incredible. Like it will cook like a pot roast in like 20 minutes, done. It's, it's, it's crazy. I won't eat them, but conceptually, though, like it's a really incredible tool. They're all over now. So really amazing. So, you guys starting to see a theme with our so, so I brought some experts? Totally. Yeah, so this is the last one of our series. We've had how many now? Three or four? So this is the last one. So if you have more questions, I would pop them out right now. Because the rest is going to get into CPAs and crap. G grab the recipes. <laughs> that I brought a handful of them. <laughs> Emails on the back. Email. <laughs> Just email me. I'll share whatever you want. Okay. So those of people who do eat meat, where do you suggest they get it? And the ones that are not injected, because I know that they are. I have a friend that was a 4-H and she raised a cat. Okay. Okay. And she said, oh, because he was going to die anyway because he was injected with so much stuff from the things he ate. Wow. All right. So the, so the question is sort of, if I was going to source meat, where am I sourcing it? I, I think it's a great question. Um, this is sort of where I'm not a super environmental guy necessarily, but this is where the environmentalist side of me kicks in, unfortunately, on this question. Um, 700 gallons of water to raise a quarter pound of beef. By the time you do the feed and the cow, 700 gallons. I, I, how, so your quarter pounder was like two months of showers or something. I'm supposed to take a five minute shower because so you can have a quarter pounder. I'm like, what? Even the, <laughs> even the, even the sort of, you know, oh, it's free range. You go, that's terrific. It takes about 50 acres to do free range. 
if all of us were going to eat free range, it would take up all of North America, all of South America. Like that would have to be your free range with no cities, no nothing. Hmm. So that for me, that my, my sort of goofy environmentalist is going to kick in. Um, but like the best source would be somebody's backyard. Like it's just somebody you knew. Like, honestly, I mean, if you're gonna if you're gonna have eggs, just go to the person that's just raising eggs, that you know, that you can see the Most chicken. Most farmers markets has a right meat person there, and they raise them in their backyard. They they should be. Right. So that one is definitely go by a hormone. Right. Whereas a chicken that is free range, he pays at least to buy fuel. Right. So that's where the that's where the right. penalty in money comes in, and that's where but a lot of people don't think to see the difference. Right. So so the commentary then is the economic difference of that yeah. is, is radically different. You can get the Foster's Farm chicken, which they brought to, which is good to go from birth to 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 fryer in three months. Or you can raise it naturally, which is like a year. T it takes a lot more feed. It's going to be cost a lot more money. Uh, or we could look at this and say, uh, let's treat meat like lobster. Like, how often do you eat lobster? Like, infrequently. So treat it like lobster. You know, I mean, even, even when we look at populations around the world that eat meat, so even like sub-Saharan African populations eat a lot of plants. They eat a little meat. It is like, it is like a quarter pound a month. Of meat is so infrequent, so small. That yeah, and and before I headed to that meat, I would ask you just try, just try a cup of beans first. Like just eat a cup of beans every day, and then go from there. Like eat all the meat you want after that, but get your cup of beans. I think it's a good start. Honestly, I mean it's super simple, super easy. Pop it out of the can if you have to. I make mine. There's no whatever. So the question is, are the tofu-type meats or the fake meats any good? They're probably not amazing for you. They're probably full of lots of things. I'll share this, though. Uh, I think they're better for you, potentially, than the real product. And they create a really nice bridge for people that are transitioning from traditional meats-type dishes to something else. Like just, you know, I want to go more plant-based. And you want to use that in the bridge? Yeah. And that's why I sort of sometimes people ask, and, and I'll say, I, I I do my best to eat a whole food plant-based diet. Like that vegan, I go, yeah, but you know, there's a lot of really good frozen vegan burgers out there that I used to eat. Like they were awesome. They're bad for me. I was fat. I was like a fat vegan. But, but like, <laughs> I can easily be a fat vegan. Where do you get your vegetables? So where do I get my vegetables from? Uh, we're lucky enough. I'm up in Tehachapi, so we're lucky enough to have tons like the farmers market. Like, we get them from there. Uh, most of our stores sell organic veg. There are lots of organic farms around there. So organic fruit, veg, and people are around. Uh, I totally do that. But Our yeah. farmer's markets, both of them have right? all that stuff. Right, the one on Main Street or something? Main like Street and it. COC. And COC, yeah. Main Street's Thursdays. And right, then, uh, COC Jesus, Saturday? Uh, Sunday. Sunday. Sunday, thank you. Like, terrific. Like, you could, that'd be fine. And I like that just from an economic standpoint. Support my local farmer. They're probably they're not getting rich, so get out there and support them. It probably takes a lot of effort to drive that lettuce from wherever they're growing it to Santa Clarita. Get out there and support them. Awesome. Any more questions, guys? I know it's a weird thing again, but we just got to open our minds and inhale yeah. it and take it in a little bit and make small baby changes. Right. Like like I thought I was all cool. I took my chorizo that I had every weekend, moved it to soy. <laughs> Chorizo, and he shot that down too. So he just. <laughs> but but I'd rather have you eating soy riso than chorizo. Yeah. Like, I'll take it. Like like if that's your transition, I'll take it. All right. Enjoy your lunch. And uh, right. thanks, Scott. You can pick the meat out of the salads if you want. Right. Yeah. Sorry about the whole salad thing.